concerns over North Korea's act of aggression, including its dispatch of soldiers to support Russia's invasion of Ukraine, have fueled a flurry of diplomatic interactions between South Korea and its global partners. Given the broader security implications of such brazen belligerence, we have details on this edition of Press Perspective. Hello, it's Tuesday, November 19th here in South Korea, and you're watching Press Perspective, our daily panel session with members of the media on issues largely pertaining to the Korean Peninsula. Today, we touch upon the sideline summits held by President Yoon Seok-yeol while in South America for the multilateral APAC gathering. For this, I have Chan Soram, a reporter for U.S.-funded news agency Radio Free Asia. Soram, welcome back. Thank you. I also have Chloe Bognon, a correspondent for French Public Broadcaster France 24. Chloe, as always, it's great to have you back. Thank you for having me. Right, Soram, we'll start with you. Let's begin with the details of the trilateral talks among the leaders of South Korea, the U.S., and Japan on the sidelines of the APEC summit in Peru. What was the gist of their discussions? So there are two key points about the talks, trilateral talks between the leaders of South Korea, the U.S., and Japan. Um, so firstly, they shared concern about North Korea and Russia's growing military ties, and they also agreed to set up um, trilateral secretariats to expand their like three countries' cooperation. Um, so South Korean President Yoon suk yeol U.S. President Joe Biden, and Japanese Prime Minister Ishiba Shigeru met last Friday and issued a joint statement focused on key global security concerns. Um, so the three, three leaders strongly condemned North Korea's recent troops deployment to Russia, calling it a violation of UN Security Council resolutions. Um, they also criticized Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, and they reaffirmed their support for Ukraine's right to self-defense. Um, the leaders emphasized their commitment to the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula um, and vote to respond firmly to North Korea's violation of UN um, resolutions, including its weapon programs, illegal cyber activities, and so on. And to strengthen three countries' cooperation, um, they announced the creation of the new trilateral secretariat to enhance security in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, they also reaffirmed their dedication to promote human rights, democracy, and stability across the Indo-Pacific and beyond, expressing confidence that their partnership will play a key role um, in maintaining peace in the years to come. Right. All that being said, Chloe, what were some of your takeaways from this latest trilateral meeting? So what's interesting to see as well uh, is the fact that it was the first time that the three heads of state were meeting since uh, the Japanese Prime Minister Chigeru Ishiba took office in October. So it's kind of interesting to see if Japan were, were to follow the trail of trilateral action. From what we can see, it's the case. So I would like to come back again yeah, on the trilateral secretariat. That's um, in fact kind of a step to forwards because of the uncertainty with uh, Donald Trump re-election and what could happen to this trilateral cooperation. So the secretariat is really there to make sure that it can coordinate and implement the different goals that they will share. And as this is, it was said, is to make sure that it's just going to be just a series of meetings. So kind of making sure that there is action taken after the words. So that's kind of interesting to see that. Uh, there's also a point that was interesting made by uh, Joe Biden, the actual US president, say that he was very proud and it was one of his great achievements to have gotten South Korea and Japan to speak and to work together again. So I feel this is something that we might have to nuance because I feel like it was also part of a President Yoon own a foreign affair, like of the policy and diplomacy, to be turning around and not like going further with the US, but also with Japan in collaboration. But it's interesting to see that for Joe Biden, this is considered as one of his proud moments of his mandate, as he's going to leave soon uh, the aid of state of the United States. 
Um, also, it's interesting to see that uh, regarding the tension that there is in the, the area, like the whole building up. So just as I thought I'm to just say that uh, we have uh, North Korea and Russia military agreements, and North Korean nuclear program, as well as the US relationship with China, with uh, Donald Trump coming back to power might get a bit like worse and might worsen a little bit. So it's interesting to see that the three countries are now trying to cement everything to try to keep as stable as possible in the Indo-Pacific area. Right. They, they do seem to seek to institutionalize their security partnership, of course. Sora, meanwhile, according to North Korea state media, Kim Jong-un has called on his military to bolster capabilities for an actual war. What do you suppose is the purpose of such rhetoric? So Kim Jong-un recently called on his military to boost its war fighting capabilities, blaming the U.S. and its allies for raising tensions on the Korean Peninsula. Um, so it's important to note that this Kim's speech and the order um, came after international criticism over growing military cooperation between North Korea and Russia. Um, so thousands of North Korean troops have been sent to Russia to support the war in Ukraine. Um, so Kim also ordered the mass production of suicide drones. Um, so this raises speculation that North Korea may also be in providing drones for use in the Ukraine conflict. Um, so experts suggest that this move could be influenced by after Kim seeing drones prominent drones having like prominent role in the Ukraine conflict. Um, so experts also believe that Russia also might be offering drone technology to North Korea so they are worried about that too. Um, so some also view North Korea's push for drone production as a potential threat to South Korea. Um, so RFA recently contacted to the US, U.S. Department of State regarding North Korea's mass drone production issue. And uh, the U.S. said they are alarmed over the growing military ties between North Korea and Russia, calling it a threat to peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula and beyond. Right. And staying with North Korea's uh, military cooperation with Russia, Chloe, there is also speculation that North Korea could send up to 100,000 soldiers to support Russia's invasion of Ukraine. What is this speculation based on and how worried do you suppose should we be? Mm. So this is... Um that, that was uh, cited, like quoted by our colleagues from Bloomberg, so the press agency. They're um, citing, like they're saying that it's from uh, someone from the G20 nations. We don't really know which country it would be because it's on the, based on anonymous uh, like informations. What they are saying is that North Korea may end up standing 100,000 soldiers in North Korea. So that sounds like a very alarming number, but what they're also saying is it is actually, um, would be not in one go, not in one batch, would be more like a few extra troops every time to actually rotate the troops that are currently in uh, Russia and fighting in, against Ukraine. So do we have to be alarmed? I would say not yet, because uh, it is said that it's just one hypothesis on how the relationship could go between, uh, the, could develop actually between North Korea and Russia. Again, that sounds like a very big number, but it's not going to be all in one time. But it's still interesting to note that it could be, like it's one of the hypotheses that's developed by some of the countries, um, because that would also mean fresh troops for Russia in a longer term. So that's interesting to see that it's, it is an hypothesis that is taken in account for the war and the pursuit of this war between Russia and Ukraine. Right. And against the backdrop of the, that um, speculation, Suram, and also after the trilateral talks, President Yoon seok and his U.S. counterpart Joe Biden held a brief bilateral uh, meeting where they reaffirmed their commitment to their country's alliance. Um, what is your evaluation of the Seoul-Washington response to Pyongyang's persistent provocations under the Yoon and Biden administration, Suram? Um, so under the UN and the Biden administration, um, South Korea and the U.S. cooperation have strengthened 
but there were not so much interaction with North Korea. Um, some experts point out that there were no diplomacy with North Korea under the Biden's presidency. Um, so with that situation, North Korea has continued its weapon development and advanced its nuclear capabilities. Um, they, the provocation has continued, including ballistic missile test, ICBM launch, um, the balloon wars between South and North Korea, and the blowing up of its inter-Korean roads, and so on. Um, so experts say Pyongyang did not show much interest with talking to Washington, um, and it seems like Washington hasn't been eager to change its approach to North Korea either. Um, so the U.S. is sticking to its demand for North Korea's complete denuclearization, um, which is not an option for North Korea this time. So experts say that the gap between the North Korea and the U.S. hasn't been narrowed down under the Biden administration. Um, however, there are also have some positive parts of it. Um, the Biden administration emphasized the importance of the South Korea and U.S. alliance, U.S. and Japan alliance, and the trilateral cooperation. Um, so this could bolster nuclear deterrence in Northeast Asia. Um, also, another positive part is that the Biden administration um, made efforts to talk to North Korea under, um, at any place um, at any time on any issue. Um, so many experts mainly blamed North Korea for the reason of the lack of dialogue between Pyongyang and Washington. Right. Uh, Chloe, President Yoon, aside from his talks with President Biden, also sat down separately with his Japanese counterpart Shigeru Ishiba on the margins, of course, of the APEC meeting in Peru. Does cooperation between Seoul and Tokyo look to um, move beyond their current levels under a second Trump administration, do you think? Yeah, I would think it's quite certain. Uh, so the fact that Donald Trump is coming back is kind of casting a cloud of uncertainty uh, for the, those two countries who have been building up a lot of relationship with the US. So we were speaking about that before, uh, but there's a stronger alliance with the US that have been developed during Joe Biden mandate for Japan and for South Korea. So the, then now they face kind of a period of doubts about what the US are going to do. Will they, will they withdraw? Will they keep going? Will that be like, because of that, there is a need for the two countries to get stability. So it, well, we spoke about it. It was done now with the trilateral secretariat, but on their side, what they could do, uh, there is at least two very strong subjects that they can work together on. First one will be economics. Um, because of the US-China war trade that didn't really stop under Biden administration, but will go on with Trump administration, this is quite sure. Uh, Japan and South Korea both are exporting a lot to the US market. So they need to find a way to stay strong, even if the Trump administration kind of changed rules. We saw that stack. Green economy, our semiconductors, everything is a bit like, not sure of what, on what's going to happen because there is this rule of America first. So uh, Donald Trump wants to get everything done in America by Americans and uh, South Korea or Japan, they could uh, suffer from that. So that would be good for them to be able to side up and be stronger in front of the US in case of negotiation. Second thing would be security. So uh, Donald Trump has already said he said it before in his first mandate. He said it already during uh, like speech during the campaign. He wants like the countries who have uh, US troops stationed to pay more. Like if we give the example of South Korea, he wants South Korea to pay $10 billion every year. So that would be nine times stronger than what Korea is already paying for. And Japan is already also having like a strong amount of US troops stationed in the country. So that's for both of them is a bit of a hard bargain. And uh, because this is like security from the US is needed at the moment. But should the two countries pay that much money? That's kind of the question. Uh, the other thing that could also happen is uh, the declaration made uh, at Camp David with uh, so South Korea, the US and Japan, uh, trilateral cooperation enhancement. 
could be reduced to zero uh, if Donald Trump decides to withdraw from any trilateral agreements. And the last thing is uh, Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un could so restart a dialogue. It happened in the first mandate and uh, Donald Trump already said that he would like to discuss with him again, speaking like to speak about the nuclear threats, as we just said, but that would be from the point of view of the US and uh, might not be in the interest of Japan or South Korea. Right. Well, uh, exactly. Chloe, as you mentioned, uh, former President Donald Trump, who is also the president-elect as we speak, he spoke of uh, Kim Jong-un missing him, I believe, while on the campaign trail. That being said, Suram, do you suppose a second Trump administration could serve to perhaps ease tensions on the Korean Peninsula? Um, some experts say that while Trump administration may not be able to resolve the like long-term issues of the Korean Peninsula, um, there is a possibility that the tensions on the Korean Peninsula could ease during his presidency. His presidency, um, if two countries resume dialogue, North Korea could be refrained from provocations and could go back to the state where inter-Korean relationships were not hostile. Um, so during presidential campaign, as you mentioned, um, Trump mentioned about having a good relationship with Kim Jong-un. So since he might want to continue pursuing that good relationship with him, um, there is a possibility that North Korea and the U.S. relations may experience some improvement when the Trump administ administration begins. Um, experts predict that although it's not going to be easy, um, efforts to resume dialogue between the U.S. and North Korea could start. And in the progress, um, North Korea's nuclear program and ICBM development may be frozen in exchange for some easing sanctions. Um, so therefore, the situation on the Korean Peninsula may become more stable than the current situation. Um, however, the prerequisites for the talks between North Korea and the US would be the end of Russia and Ukraine war. Um, North Korea is heavily involved in the Russia-Ukraine war as North Korea sent troops to Russia. So this could be one of the obstacles for the US-North Korea talks. Right. Mima, Chloe, during a bilateral summit between President Tsai Ing-wen and his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping, the Chinese leader shared hopes for a strategic partnership with South Korea based on, and I quote, geographical proximity, cultural affinity and economic integration. Again, what are your thoughts regarding cooperation between Seoul and Beijing under a second Trump administration? So there again, I would say that there is a need for the two countries to develop relationship. It's interesting to see that the last time the two head of state met, it was two years ago. So I mean, bilateral relationships between China and South Korea has been developing and we have seen uh, the foreign minister, like the prime minister, so coming to South Korea and on the other way as well. So I feel like relationships are existing and they have not stopped or under any circumstances. But it's interesting to see that the two presidents are meeting again now. Uh, so obviously China is always uh, targeted by the Donald Trump administration and uh, he's been speaking about it, like especially in economic terms. Um, so for a China point of view, there is a need to get to you know, better relationship with uh, South Korea. So, for example, it's interesting to see that uh, Xi Jinping called for safeguarding the free trade system between the two countries. And he said that China will be open to get Korean uh, capitals. And so interesting to see that this is one of the main points developed there. Um, there is also the fact that for uh, China, there is something about uh, the fact that Russia that was also a partner and North Korea that was another partner, they are getting closer on their side. And so China would need to get other allies in the peninsula. Um, from the South Korean point of view, there is also a question of security once again, uh, because uh, China wants peace in the area here in the Korean peninsula. And uh, Yun suk yeol said that for him, China is, and I quote him, an important engine uh, to contribute to regional peace and stability. So that's interesting to see that there are like two strong points there in the relationship and 
both the countries know that it will be economics and it will be securities and they're aware of it even if the stands are a bit like different from both countries but it's interesting to see that dialogue is going on and is being quite transparent and clear there. Right, and speaking of dialogue going on, Soram, during bilateral talks with uh, U.S. President Joe Biden, Chinese President Xi Jinping spoke about uh, seeking amicable ties with the U.S. under a second Trump administration, as long as the incoming president does not cross, and I believe he said four red lines. What are the four red lines, and do you believe Mr. Trump will abide by these red lines? Um, so China's President Xi Jinping said four red lines, as you mentioned. So the red lines are Taiwan issue, democracy, and human rights, China's peasant system, and lastly, the con country's right to development. Um, in a statement after the meeting with Biden, Xi emphasized that these are the red lines and they must not be challenged. Um, and also added that these are the most important safety notes um, for the U.S.-China relations. Um, so the U.S. President-elect Donald Trump uses American first foreign policy approach. So during his term, he was often criticized by international community by not putting um, great emphasis on human rights issue. So that's one part. Um, however, it's unclear if Trump will accept all the like four red lines. Um, he has threatened to hit Beijing with extensive trips um, on all imports from China, and he, nomi he nominated a few hardliners on China to lead his foreign policy team. So it's highly likely that if Trump returns to the White House, um, he may impose higher tariffs, um, not only on China, but also on other US allies. Um, so also during Trump's first term, he focused on countering China's rise and took a tough stance. So it looks like his second term will keep the same um, focus on China. Um, so experts are not expecting the US-China relation to start off on a positive level. Um, so right now it seems that way, but we may get a clear picture when Trump administration kicks up. Right, next January that would be. Chloe, beyond Asia, how is Europe, namely France, preparing for a second Trump administration? So France and Europe actually uh, together uh, is getting ready because there have been changes in four years. I mean, four years ago, Donald Trump was uh, head of state, Emmanuel Macron was also head of state, but because of, mostly because of the war in Ukraine, uh, things have changed. So Europe has three big worries regarding the position of the Trump administration, would be the US position on war in Ukraine, US position on wars in the Middle East, and lastly, uh, the position of US against China in a commercial war. So what France could work on is, um, in Ukraine, they could try to secure a guarantee, like get security guarantees if there is a deal struck with uh, Russia, which seems to be the position that wants to take Donald Trump, but we're not sure about that. Uh, then there will also be, we have to get ready for a commercial war kind of against France with a tax on import products, again, America first policy. And the last thing uh, will also be the question of French relationship, for example, with China. But this is already something that was happening uh, with uh, pressure coming from the Joe Biden administration as well, asking France to kind of get away from China's in a commercial matter and get closer to the US. So that would probably still be a strong point of right. integration. Some issues for France to work on then as we move forward. All right, Chloe, as always, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. Thank you. And Saram, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you. Right, well, that ends this edition of Press Perspective. We return same time tomorrow with a look at the latest Group of 20 Summit in Brazil this week and its broader implications.